equitably we own and access our energy systems or services. But even then, justice isn't just those two things. There's a whole third stream of research on procedures or governance, if you want a different term, or free prior informed consent. This is all about decision making. This is all about uh, processes of, of um, engagement and inclusion and how, how honest they are. Is it consultation or just uh, information? Finally, there's a very recent stream of justice work on recognition. Or if you use Nancy Fraser's term, the injustice of misrecognition. And this is kind of a special placeholder uh, for vulnerable groups. So costs and benefits and procedures can exist in, in kind of in a vacuum almost, where you kind of can talk about them in the abstract. But recognition kind of says, well, we want to have special consideration for marginalized groups, for indigenous peoples, for those with disabilities, for the chronically poor. Uh, or other categories of, of ethnic minorities who maybe don't deserve equal treatment, they deserve special treatment given their low capacity to adapt or their limited resources or previous waves and cycles of dispossession and victimization. Because of those four themes, energy justice is very much unlike other frames or heuristics that we usually use in the field. So this is from my colleague, Darren McCauley. Um, points if you can catch the typo he misspelled accessibility it's missing its why but anyway what he's kind of showing here on the left is that an energy justice lens sits in this kind of nested hierarchy of where if we're talking about sustainability maybe we look at carbon and if we're talking about availability maybe it's security of supply and if it's accessibility only it's poverty but justice can enable us to look at all of those it's in like the middle of the triangle so it brings all of those elements into its frame or its domain. And on the right is a similar diagram that just shows its positionality across disciplines, how maybe an environmental sciences focus gets you things like ecosystem vitality or the you know food versus fuel debate for biofuel, or a politics stance looks at things like coalitions and lobbies. And an economics one might be pricing regimes and tariffs. Well, energy law, and policy is where justice is. So it sits at that nexus between or incorporating environmental sciences, politics, and economics together. So if you want a very kind term, it's a holistic perspective. If you want an unkind term, it is a messy perspective that sits between these different disciplines. How it's been applied in the fields, um, there are lots of different ways. Um, the two that I enjoy are more uh, interdisciplinary, so they kind of draw on multiple themes. I like Kirsten Jenkins. This was this was here, Alyssa, before I realized she spoke to you last year. She has a very nice review that talks about four tenets of justice and then how they create evaluative and normative pressures on how we understand energy systems. And what I like about this framework is it isn't just distributional justice. It isn't just procedural justice. And there are lots of papers that take only one of those lenses, like a distributional look at EVs or a procedural look at wind power planning in the Eastern US. And I like that you have all four of these because they give you different things, right? They help you evaluate what's wrong, who's ignored, how unfair our processes, but they also point the way prescriptively towards how we can solve them. So energy justice enables us to do descriptive and prescriptive analysis, evaluative and normative types of assessments, uh, which is unique. Many of us are trained, even I was trained not to be normative. I was trained to be a neutral, dispassionate scholar, don't get involved in these controversies. And so it kind of helps blend that divide between scholarship and advocacy. And you can see this is just an example of where we applied it um, a few years ago to electric mobility in the Nordic region. So you can see each of the four tenets of justice and you can see what they mean and then you can see what their application to electric mobility reveals about what's wrong with the uptake of electric vehicles and uh, e-mobility in Norway and Iceland and Finland and Denmark and, and Sweden. And we'll talk more about that in a bit because it's one of the cases for the second half of the presentation. The other way um, that people apply it are the principles of justice. Um, and I guess I'm guilty here of trying to create these principles uh, with Michael Dworkin and others in, in some of my earlier works. 
So the argument here is you have, it was initially eight, we added two more to 10 principles. These are qualitative principles. They're, high, they're not hierarchical, so they're all meant to be equal. Um, and they sound good, right? Like principle of due process says that we should respect human rights and the principle of equity says that people have a right to fairly access energy services and resistance says we have a moral duty to oppose oppression and hegemony. So they sound good, but then you kind of start to realize that in practice, it could be very, very difficult to meet them all. Like you maybe can think of an energy policy or program or technology that meets two of them or three of them, but when you start to tick them off, they start to trade off. And that I think is both the merit and the detriment of a principle approach is it's very, very hard to satisfy all of the principles. Um, and we've had colleagues try to quantify them. So my colleague, Raphael Hefron has the energy justice metric, uh, which takes some of these and tries to quantify metrics for them. I don't do that here. This is more kind of just qualitatively, we should think about in our decisions, these principles as guiding criteria for what is just and what is not just. Because there's so many principles, in practice, we've gotten away with just applying some of them. So in this paper, we took four innovations, energy service contracts, EVs, uh, solar household solar panels, and low carbon heat, usually through retrofits, like heat pumps, um, and showed with just four principles. So only four of these principles are used in this paper, affordability, sustainability, equity, and respect. And we showed quite troublingly, well, two things. All four of these low carbon innovations in the UK have positive justice dimensions, hurrah. Unfortunately, all of them also have negative ones. So there's no net plus winner, right? In terms of justice, all of the systems create justice trade-offs. And all of them also create trade-offs among different principles. That's the other thing. Some principles are achieved like affordability only at the expense of others like equity or possibly respect. So this creates what we've called the political economy of justice. But for the purposes of this part of the talk, it's more meant to say that when you operationalize these principles, it doesn't have to be all 10. And even us, the architects of the principles, have only used two or four uh, and still had quite interesting, I hope, uh, analysis result. So the second part of what I wanted to do in the talk before we get to some of the empirical research is kind of take you through the energy justice literature since we launched these principles and frameworks and kind of tell you where it is as well as what's wrong with it, which is maybe things you can address in your own research. Uh, and so we call these, we like to make things spicy, uh, new frontiers. So what are the new energy justice frontiers? And we hypothesized these a few years ago, but I can tell you as an editor and as a peer reviewer, these six frontiers are still valid. 90% of the energy justice work that I see is not within the frontiers. So I will stand here in 2021 and say, I think that they still stand as, as actual new frontiers. And so what are they? First one is one that critiques myself, <laughs> benefit of scholarship. And that is in our work, this is a book uh, with Cambridge University Press that I did with Michael Dworkin who's a wonderful chap, he's at Vermont Law School, although he's now retired. And in our book, we took four classic justice theorists and four modern justice concepts. So the top four go back thousands of years and the bottom four only go back maybe a few decades. The top four take notions of virtue and utility and human rights, the Magna Carta and procedural justice. Um, and the bottom four are very much newer systems of justice like Rawls or libertarianism or Dworkin um, or people like Peter Singer. And we applied each of these different concepts to one energy topic. Now we could have taken one concept and applied it to all topics. We could have had like a mixing and a matching, but that would have made things a messy book. So for the book's focus, it was just one energy topic per concept. So publish the book. Hurrah, thought we did a really good job. And then we noticed a problem, actually two problems with this table. And feel free if you wanna talk at this point, this is if we were in person, I would say, raise your hand. So anyone in the audience, what, what could be wrong with this wonderful table of philosophical influences? Anything, feel free to speak. Oh. 
or, or chat. Very good, Margaret. Yes, you actually nailed it. There are a lot of white men. Um, in fact, I think there are only two women. And how you classify Amartya Sen is tricky because he is a person of color, but he was trained in the, in the West. He was trained at Oxford. So does he count as global north or global south is kind of a debate. So we've got two issues here. We got a lot of men and then we got a lot of people from the West, right? From, from Greco Roman times up to like Rawls who's writing also from Harvard. And so that's the first new frontier. What about new ways of thinking about justice that draw from subaltern or non-white, non-Western perspectives? Whether it's notions of Ubuntu in South Africa or some of the Eastern philosophies, Taoism, Confucianism, Dharma, Buddhism, or indigenous perspectives of the Navajo or the Sami here in Northern Europe, um, or perhaps even gypsies and travelers who are another displaced community. They all have equal validity in their application to understand energy systems and to determine what is fair and right. And so we don't have to rely on these Western masculine notions of justice. And I'm very happy that some research has emerged using Buddhist approaches, Ubuntu approaches, and some indigenous perspectives on justice very recently, especially anti-colonialist perspectives, anti-racist perspectives, which I completely celebrate. Uh, but I think there's much, much more work to be done on this regard. All right, second one. This is a bit trickier. What is also wrong? with this table or these types of thinking. I know it's it's early in the morning. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll make this easy because it's a, it's a mistake that I make in my research as well. We focus a lot on humans, right? Justice, Martin Luther King and others is about human affairs. That's why it's social justice. And so it doesn't really do a really good job breaking beyond what's called anthropocentrism. A lot of justice thinking is about making human life better even at the expense of the environment. Um, and I think that also requires us to think about more rights-based and nature-based notions of justice. And you have people talking about the rights of nature, you have Nash talking about environmental ethics, right? That talk about how humans have a duty, right? To protect and preserve the biosphere independent of what ecosystem services it provides. It's beautiful and lovely. Right. And that's why we should protect it, not because it gives us clean air or clean water. And there are, again, a whole set of non-human centered justice theories like animal centrism and biocentrism and ecocentrism that value nature and other forms of life spiritually uh, and non-instrumentally. That also could open up new ways of thinking about energy justice, which we also celebrate to kind of reject this anthropocentrism. The third area is also quite tricky, and it's also one that is critiquing some of the earlier justice work that I did, where I would provide case studies and we would say, ah, here's our case study of what Denmark has done to create a low carbon regime with benefits for customers and resilience in the environment. Or here's our example of the Warm Front program, which is the largest fuel poverty program in Europe, which helped lift millions of UK homes out of fuel poverty. Problem with these cases is they're nicely bounded by a country, uh, but lots of justice issues are actually multi-scalar. And that becomes very apparent here in this work from Stephen Davis and Ken Caldiera that talks about embodied emissions. And you can see for China there, it's like you know 80% of Chinese emissions are embodied in products that are traded globally. So China is a net exporter of, of intensive emissions products. And look at us, the US at the bottom is the net importer. And one of the problems with a lot of scholarship, including the UN, because the way that we account for carbon emissions is based on NDCs, which are countries, is we miss these global traded emissions. And this can be quite substantial. I forget the exact number, but it's something like 70% of greenhouse gas emissions are accounted for in these trading flows. Um, and so it's quite hard to talk about energy justice issues when you talk about only a given location. It's all relational, it's all globalized, and there are very complex supply chains that wrap around the world and complicate our analytical categories. I have published research arguing about the Danish wind model and how what Denmark has done for wind energy makes a lot of sense. Other countries could learn from how they've done their feed-in tariffs and their carbon taxes. 
But another explanation is that Denmark has been able to pursue wind only because they're part of Nord Pool, the Nordic Power Pool. And they have the luxury of tapping into the pumped hydro reserves of Norway and the ability to sell and wheel power into the high priced German retail market during times of peak demand. Right. And so even it's a mistake. There's no such thing as the Danish wind model. It's the Northern European grid. Right. So Denmark is embedded in the cross scalar issues that happen to benefit it regionally. And this becomes even more apparent. We had some fun here. We teamed up with researchers at one of the largest manufacturers of wind energy. I can't tell you who, but you can guess because if we list their affiliation, <laughs> we conducted what's called an environmental profit and loss. So this is kind of neat. The first company to do this was Puma, the shoemaker, where they wanted to showcase how sustainable their shoes were. So they did like an environmental audit across their supply chain, where they looked at like the amount of, of air pollution and carbon and waste that were in built into their supply chain for shoes. And they were really embarrassed because it turns out that, that almost all of the value of their shoes was offset by the environmental damage they were causing. So let's just say Puma didn't do a second environmental profit and loss after the first one. We replicated Puma's methodology. We took the same metrics, air pollution, CO2 and waste, and applied them to wind energy, to the supply chain. And we had a similar revelation, holy crap. Like these are the environmental damages with three different types of offshore wind farms by turbine with real world data. This is actual supply chain data from that company. And these 3.1 megawatt offshore wind turbines cost about 3 million euros. So you can see for the offshore concrete one, you're losing a million euros of value already with the environmental damage that it causes. However, here's where it gets really tricky. These wind turbines were all deployed in Northern Europe, but we also tracked with the supply chain where the damages came from, and they didn't come from Europe. 80% of the damages came from China and South Korea. So again, we have this really complex multi-scalar issue. Wind energy seems to be very clean in the Nordic region because all the externalities with making it, the steel, the concrete, uh, fiberglass, are outsourced to Asia. And it gets even worse um, when you then account for actual exports of fossil fuels because the Nordic region, which is low carbon, is a net exporter of fossil fuel. Uh, and they export about three times as much fossil fuel, especially Norway oil and gas and Denmark oil and gas. Denmark even had a company called Dong, Danish oil and natural gas, which they've renamed. So this becomes really, really pesky, right? Uh, and it really challenges our thinking about the kind of Nordic low carbon transition and things like Norway becoming the world leader in electric vehicles because they still export a whole crap load of fossil fuels. So if you want an analogy that I tell my students, it would be the equivalent of a country abolishing slavery and then still selling slaves on the market. Uh, and so I think that very questionably raises the morality of these types of low carbon transitions. But these things only become apparent when you start to adopt whole systems multi-scalar lenses, which most of us do not adopt. All right, we're halfway through the new frontiers. There's only six. So the fourth one is business models. And I'm this is Abraham Lincoln, by the way, although I'm guessing most of you probably guess that. Uh, he's here because he used to have a famous quote when he was debating in the Lincoln-Douglas debates in Illinois when he was running for Senate, that he would take a, a Bible and he put a silver dollar on top of it. And you would say, no person can see the word of justice when it's covered by the silver dollar. The argument there is that if we're blinded by profit, we're not gonna be focused on justice. And there's something intuitive there. However, is it always the case? Isn't what's just also sometimes good for the bottom line, right? Because injustice creates damages and community opposition and protests and can lead to boycotts and direct action and sabotage. Uh, and so I think this kind of nexus of what is both just and good for business could harness business models for energy justice. And as a very exploratory study, we found four examples here in Europe of companies that both had a business model that was viable, so they still exist, they create revenue, and they met energy justice goals. So it's not this Sophie's choice of you're just or profitable. You can be just and profitable in very particular situations. 
although I should mention these are extreme cases, like these are not representative cases. We had to look really hard to find business models oriented towards justice. Um, they also operate at different scales. So the top one is a cooperative that operates at the neighborhood scale. The second one is a very small utility called Robin Hood Energy because it's near Nottingham. The third is an energy service company that does retrofits. And then the fourth is called a community interest company that shares its ownership structure. So half of their wind farms, every wind farm they have, half is owned by the local community. So they are very unique business structures, but at least we can show there are examples of where you can generate business models that don't contravene some of the justice principles. All right, the fifth one is in simple terms, winners and losers, or if you're at the middle of your PhD uh, defense, political economy, both of them kind of mean the same things. This shows you in an article about climate change adaptation, um, how a lot of the things we need to do to promote resilience can become captured by elites or can become co-opted across the global north or the global south, whether it's relocating indigenous people from desalination plants or the capture of disaster recovery aid in Honduras by elites or sea barriers in Alaska going to the wealthy parts of the neighborhood. This also happened with Katrina uh, or coastal protection in Norway benefiting only the elite um, or marine protected areas in Tanzania, right? That exclude fishers who can't make a livelihood or the creation of drought palaces in Kenya, where they also corrupt officials stole a bunch of aid. Um, so it's not good, right, that you can create losers alongside winners as we try to grapple with climate change. And this becomes quite dehumanizing and compelling when you think through some of the vicious trade-offs that occur. And I've got two examples for you. This is a nine-year-old coal miner in Northern India. The coal that they're mining, right? So this person spends 10 to 12 hours in the dark with very little PPE, with inadequate training in ways that almost certainly shorten their life to create lumps of coal, right? That then are used to help other children at schools, right? And in communities that use solid fuels and that want to displace that with coal, right? So coal fired power of which this coal goes to is having huge dividends for women and children, but it's also dependent on child labor to keep costs low because they want coal to be affordable. So there's a great trade-off, a depressing trade-off in our principles. Affordability trades off with labor quality. Or here, these show you thyroid cancer victims from Chernobyl, except that boy on the right was born in 1990. Uh, and so these incidences of cancer are still occurring 30, 40 years after the accident, 1986. Uh, there's even a condition known as Chernobyl heart, uh, where huge rates of birth defects are happening in Belarus and parts of Ukraine. But nuclear power in that part of the Soviet Union for 30 years was the backbone of modernization, industrialization, and lifting living standards. So again, it's a very pernicious trade-off. Hundreds of millions of people benefited from nuclear power, but then met the risk of accidents and cancers is concentrated among very marginal communities. Is that fair? Is that right? I don't know, but at least it starts to reveal to you the hidden losers of a lot of the energy choices and transitions that we, that we often make. And that's why the political economy of justice tries to have an eye for those to help identify marginalized groups, even in pro-just interventions. All right, last one, discourse. Um, some of you who maybe have studied social science may know about David Harvey. David Harvey is a very good political ecologist and geographer who talks about justice in some of his work. And he is quite frankly critiquing justice for being captured by market elites who use the rhetoric of justice to mask their injustice, right? Justice creates false discourse where you have people like President Trump say that they're just, or you have people who are promoting liber liberal market reforms that capture rent, but use it in terms of justice or doing this for justice and equity. So he's really critical of justice discourse as a false performance that only leads to elite actors accumulating wealth and dispossessing the poor. So he's asking us to be very careful about justice language, and that needs deconstructed 
And I can give you two examples. I think it's only one example for this talk, but in the paper we give three. This was an advertising campaign run by Chevron that chose two women of color, and it says, great, oil companies should support the communities they're a part of. We agree, stamp, with the CEO. This campaign was being run at the same time Chevron admitted in US court to committing acts of violence, kidnapping, and terrorism against communities. It doesn't get any more Orwellian than that, right? They run a glossy campaign about how they're supporting communities when they're actually paying insurgent groups to attack communities who are opposing some of their oil and gas wells. Um, so this is precisely the sort of justice discourse that Harvey is critical of. Okay, so that's the six frontiers. In the next and final part of the presentation, I'm talking about our latest work from the Inapaths Project, Decarbonization and Its Discontents, where we intentionally tried, you ready for this? I can't believe this took me like 10 minutes to design. Alyssa, if you're ready, you're gonna see some colors. So our latest work from Inapaths was designed explicitly to tackle two of the new frontiers. There's the first one, you saw it, it just glowed, number three. And there's the, the other one, number five. Yeah, I'm so bad with animation. So we intentionally chose looking at cross-scalar issues and looking at winners and losers together. And to do that, we draw from a very nice paper by Noel Healy, Jenny Stevens, and Stephanie Malin about the embodied injustices with energy systems. So in their work, this is a diagram from their paper, they looked at coal. And they said, you know, one of the problems with coal and many other energy systems is we only look at where it's used. So we have like an environmental impact statement for a coal-fired power plant at the site of combustion or production. And that's where that box is, right? And that's where a lot of us focus. It's where we take our photographs of the cooling towers. It's where James Hansen is getting arrested for climate protests, right? But in obsessing over coal production and use and its air pollution, perhaps, we kind of miss all of the hidden injustices in other parts of coal's life cycle, like coal mining, coal extraction, coal processing, coal transportation via rail or barges, and then things like coal disposal, like fly ash, where you have things like the Kingston fly ash spill, a billion dollar accident in Tennessee, related to an impoundment reservoir for fly ash. Um, and they're very worried that in doing that, we miss all of the slow violence and human rights abuses and biodiversity loss and disruption of livelihoods that occur all of across these uh, sacrifice zones. And we were really inspired by Healy's study, but we thought, uh oh, okay, I understand these exist for coal and oil and gas. What about, what about renewables? What about nuclear power? What about the pro-climate interventions? So the pro-climate interventions that we want, heat pumps, EVs, smart meters, et cetera, also have these hidden injustices? And if so, what do they look like? So we intentionally embarked on a, on a project um, that looked at four energy transitions. So our unit of analysis was a transition, and we took two supply-side transitions and two demand-side transitions. So the supply-side ones were nuclear power in France and household solar energy in Germany. And our demand side transitions were electric vehicles in Norway and smart meters in Great Britain for electricity and natural gas. Um, this gets you three neat things. It gets you uh, a diversity or heterogeneity of cases, hurrah. It gets you transitions that occur in different times. So like the French nuclear rollout was really accelerated in the 70s and 80s, 1973 Mesmer plan. Uh, the German feed-in tariff begins in the 90s and is accelerated in 2000s with the EEG. Norway's BEV transition kind of starts in the 2000s, accelerates in the 2010s, and the UK is in the middle of their smart meter transition with um, targets set for 2024. Every home and small business here is supposed to be offered a smart meter by 2024. So we get you four different historical transitions at four different temporalities. But the final thing of which I like about them is all four of these transitions are massive and world leading in their own right. France still gets about three quarters of its electricity from nuclear power, and it is the largest exporter of nuclear power in the world. Germany has by far the largest per capita use of solar than any other country in the world. 
Norway, I just read this yesterday, is now 80% of new car sales in Norway are BEVs. Their per capita adoption of EVs is 40 times larger than the number two market, which is China. And Great Britain will be distributing 56 million smart meters and in-home displays, which makes it the infrastructural challenge of this generation, so the government says. So we have four very big world-leading transitions um, that some people even use as archetypes or templates for how other countries should model their transitions. So if we identify justice problems here, oh boy, we're in trouble. We're a big fan uh, at my energy center of qualitative research. And we're a big fan of what's called mixed methods research, where we don't just collect data from one source, we collect it from multiple sources. So our mixed methods research design involved expert interviews uh, with actually really powerful experts. We were kind of surprised that these people all chose to speak with us because they're the stakeholders <laughs> behind the transitions. And we weren't coy in our invitation. We didn't like say, oh, we kind of want to talk about the benefits. We were like, we're doing a study on the injustices of transitions. And they still spoke to us. So our access to the elites was incredible. The Atomic Energy Commission, EDF, right? Uh, School of Mines, the IEA, the Federal Ministry of, of Energy in Germany, and the German Solar Energy Association. Ministry of Transport in Norway and the Electric Vehicle Association, the Department of Energy, it's called BASE here in the UK, and Smart Energy GB, that is the government sponsor of the rollout. Their job is only to deliver smart meters. Um, so our access uh, was better than expected and unprecedented. However, as maybe some of you can appreciate because you got my question earlier about what's wrong with Western white men thinking, there's also something wrong if you only go to experts to talk about justice, especially if we're talking about communities and people. Where, where are you talking to the public? So we wanted to complement these expert interviews, which were also mostly in urban areas, Paris, Berlin, Oslo, and London, with focus groups. And we intentionally chose rural areas or small communities for the focus groups like Lewis and Colmar and Freiburg and Stavanger. And the focus groups were great. We got mothers and families and students uh, and, and the elderly and others to participate. Um, but again, because the focus groups were good, but they were also geographically bounded, whoever showed up that day at the focus group could make it. We also wanted a third method to get general public stuff. And focus groups have their own issues. Focus groups are groups and some people don't speak well in groups. So we wanted a final method that was open to all of the public but also enabled people to feel comfortable in being honest. And there's nothing like the internet to get people to open up. So the final part of data collection is we joined intensively 12 internet forums where they were having discussions about that transition with more than 2 million members. So the argument was like, in principle, hundreds of thousands of members of the public could have participated, even though we only got about 60 people to engage. Um, but at least it was a real attempt uh, to harness public thinking, to complement the focus groups, and to complement the expert interviews. So with our research design set, I, I, I almost took this out, but I kept it in because we are students and we are learning. It's good to talk about limitations. Although we had all that push for public data from the focus group and from the internet forums, we still had more expert responses. So we're still a kind of a weighting in our evidence towards expert opinion. The work that we did is largely critical. Um, we did a second piece, which I'll spend like a few minutes on talking about co-benefits, but the rest of the talk is about injustices. Because we had those three mixed methods and four cases, that's a lot of data, we didn't then do a deep triangulated literature review, right? So it could very well be that some of our experts said stuff that's wrong. We didn't check, we didn't have time to check. We're taking the expert data at face value. If they said, France had a nuclear accident on this date. We're taking them that that's true. Uh, and so our limitation there is it's only as good as the respondent's knowledge, which isn't always accurate. We also didn't correct people. If they said stupid stuff, we didn't laugh, right? If people talked about an injustice, right, that we didn't think was really an injustice, like people talked about traffic jams. EVs in the bus lane, slowing down the bus, gosh darn it. We nodded our heads and said, yes, that's horrible, rather than thinking, is that really an injustice? So 
what you're getting is people's perceptions of injustices and potential anticipated injustices rather than de facto it's shown to be an injustice that actually happened. However, to offset these weaknesses, we did code everything. So we did full transcription, full coding, and full frequency counts, which you'll see in a moment. So you get a sense for how much something comes up. Is it like in all the interviews or just in one? And we have another paper, which I'm not gonna talk about, which was quite interesting, which is about user-based injustices, where users cause injustices among other users, which is a kind of gentle critique of the whole user innovation school and uh, responsible research innovation and inclusion. Because some users you don't want to include because they have bad views or they impose their views on others. So let's start with the good news. First question we asked, and also for balance, and also to get our respondents warmed up, was tell us what's good. Tell us about the co-benefits, however they respondent define them, to the transitions in question. And I'm very, well, you can see here, this is our uh, frequency count table. So for co-benefits for the French nuclear rollout, and you can see on the right, it's in order of frequency. So how often it came up, and RI means research interview, IF means internet forum, and FG means focus group. So it's a nice way of ordering them by commonality or frequency within the material. And I'm quite surprised. We didn't know what we were gonna find. Uh, obviously you can see the seven benefits here to French nuclear power. How many in total? Drum roll, 128. <laughs> So we identified, just from asking those experts and internet forums and focus groups, tell us about what you think the benefits are to these transitions, 128 analytically distinct co-benefits. Many of these were economic, which is to be expected, like fuel savings or jobs or export markets or profits and revenues for companies. Many of them are environmental, like carbon and air pollution and better land use and avoided externalities, but, this is why the article is called Beyond Cost and Carbon. The rest were not. So the rest fall into these different categories that the literature doesn't really explore well. So we had a lot of social benefits, right? Like national pride um, or feeling prestigious or feeling environmentally aware. This is one of my favorites in Norway, guilt-free driving. <laughs> People felt less guilty when they drove, right? And so we have all these benefits that are kind of hard to monetize, but there were 30 of them. And we had another 31 that were about things like innovation um, and coupling of systems. So you have solar and smart meters go together or storage or the simulation of prosuming, peer-to-peer -peer trading, blockchain, et cetera. And then we also had political benefits um, like reduced energy dependence or political posturing. Uh, and I think that's quite neat because it, it really shows you the diversity of the co-benefits and it also shows you that these transitions aren't just bad. They also are doing a lot of good things in terms of the jobs and the environment and political systems. You can also see that they're pretty equally distributed among the four transitions. It wasn't like it was just Great Britain that grab, grabbed them all, right? All of the transitions have between 25 and 45 co-benefits. They weren't that consolidated with one technology or transition. Okay, what about the injustices? Second paper, same sort of coding. You can again see this is the distributional injustices for French nuclear power. For this paper, we took the tenets approach to justice. So we divided the injustices into distributive, procedural, uh, cosmopolitan, and recognition. And again, if I was with you, I'd ask you to guess, but uh, how many injustices do we have? Well, at least I'm happy to say there were more co-benefits. 128 co-benefits, 120, it's close, injustices. And again, you can see here how they're pretty evenly distributed um, by the transitions. And they're a little bit tilted towards distributive issues, um, but you still see all four represented. So the two things that I find striking about this we anticipated that after distributive injustices, the procedural ones would come next because everyone's talking about planning and policy, but the fact that recognition issues came up is very troubling because that was our placeholder for vulnerable groups. So that's bad. The other thing that still blows my mind is that smart meters had more injustices than nuclear power. Uh, so what the heck, right? Now you start to get into maybe reasons why. Look back here, 
um, you also had more co-benefits identified. So it could just be that our great British respondents liked to talk and were more comfortable with talking about both benefits. I think it also relates to the fact that smart meters are in the home. And so they're viewed as more intrusive and more connected to like people's justice thinking where nuclear power is more remote and centralized. So it could be kind of out of sight, out of mind. And I think the final thing, my English respondents agree, British people like to complain more than French people. <laughs> And French people maybe don't like to question the state. So there could also be cultural issues behind those types of responses. I wouldn't take this as evidence that smart meters are more unjust than nuclear power or EVs or solar, but it is how our data played out. Okay, I promised you that we would look at a whole systems lens. And we took the Healy et al. framework of embodied energy injustices and we kind of mapped it out a little bit in more nuance. And so we should have maybe named this something. Instead, I guess it's a multispatial, multi-temporal framework. <laughs> but you get an idea for it. So on the left, you can see that we tried to classify injustices across different spatial scales. And for simplicity, there are local issues that happen near communities. There are national issues that proliferate across the country. And there are global issues that are transnational or beyond Europe. We also wanted to look at different elements of the transition, just like Healy said. Don't just look at where it's used or consumed. We also looked at things like the front end, minerals, mining, extraction, and fuel processing, as well as things like the back end and the afterlife, waste, repowering, disposal, and recycling. And it creates this beautiful matrix of injustices that cut across scales and cut across temporalities. If you take just this macro scale at the top of global injustices, this was shocking to us. Everywhere in red is an injustice that was identified by our respondents as happening outside of the transitioning question. So this really underscores the multiscalar nature of these transitions and how they're implicated in, well, disruption of tar sands profitability in Canada, interference with Peabody coal exports from the US, toxicity and pollution from lithium mines in South America, electronic waste flows going to central sub-Saharan Africa, interruption of LNG export viability in Australia, reliance on Uyghurs and forced labor for manufacturing solar panels in China, interruption of profits for Gazprom, the displacement of fossil fuel vehicles that end up in places like Nigeria or Eastern Europe, because fossil fueled cars don't just disappear from Norway, they end up somewhere else. They're resold and reshipped. Um, so it really underscores in a very depressing way how low carbon transitions don't just have losers, those losers are global uh, due to the interconnected multi-scalar nature of transitions processes. The other thing that we found is that some of those impacts aren't distributed equally. Following recognitional justice, they tend to hit some very, very vulnerable groups like electronic waste workers or artisanal miners, or French winemakers, or modern slaves, uh, which are hidden into a lot of the supply chains for these technologies. We still have about four or five million modern slaves, according to the Human Rights Lab at Nottingham University. Um, women and children are also perpetually impacted. Um, and unions and workers, we often forget about the labor side of these supply chains. Uh, and many of them aren't unionized, or they have precarious jobs. Uh, or other types of issues like um, poor working conditions. So, and this is also a very recent review we did of 20 years of geography research called Who Were the Victims of Low Carbon Transitions? And this got quite big. So 20 years of research, 198 studies, 332 case studies. So it's a pretty large and qualitative case comparison. And look at the table on the right, it says, Okay, within that corpus of literature, who is victimized? Number one, non-human species. Number two, host communities. So it's like, wow, that's not good. That our low carbon transitions are themselves hurting the environment and are also hurting most those who adopt them. And then you can see a whole other list in order of frequency by the evidence, farmers, the rural poor, fishers, the urban poor, women, prostitutes, students, alcoholics are even mentioned. Um, the mafia is even involved in some wind supply chains, right? So, so it's, it's connected to assassinations 
and kidnappings. Um, so you start to see who our energy systems are hurting as we rush to adopt climate mitigation technologies. And this is a placeholder. Uh, we cataloged every time that evidence mentioned an indigenous group. And again, here it's, it's quite depressing. You can see multiple indigenous groups around the world impacted oftentimes by multiple transitions at once, like the indigenous communities in Bolivia who are under threat from EV development, smart grids, storage, lithium, et cetera. What's really depressing about this table is you're only seeing the first third of it. So it goes on Zapotec communities in Mexico, indigenous communities in Chile, the Dayak communities in Borneo, indigenous communities in Nepal, indigenous first peoples in Australia, six nations communities in Canada, the Yorong Ulu people who were in Sarawak, Malaysia, and on uh, ethnic groups in Ghana, farmers in Uganda, Hispanic neighborhoods in the US, right? Indigenous groups in Cameroon, indigenous groups in Argentina, um, people in the Tapajó River Valley. Um, so, and basically indigenous communities are under siege from low carbon development. That inspired us to do a second phase of research for Inapaths, where we then tried to identify four very vulnerable groups, and we went and did ethnographic research to document their lived experiences. Keeping in line with the first phase, it's a mixed methods approach. So we did our expert interviews, we did our community interviews, and we did site visits. Um, it was quite expensive. We kind of overspent our budget, had to get our department to, to put in our own money, and I have to give my research team credit. All of us donated our own funds as well to do some of this research. Um, and we chose one community for each of the four transitions that was being threatened by the transition. So for nuclear power, it was French wineries. For German solar energy, it was solar workers themselves. For uh, smart meters, it was electronic waste flows going to Ghana. Turns out that 70% of e-waste in the UK ends up at Ogbogbashi in Ghana. And for EVs, it was cobalt mining. And for each of those cases, again, we did expert interviews. Maybe more importantly this time, we did community interviews. So you can see my poor French research fellow had to go spend a weekend with six winemakers and wine growers in the Rhone Valley. Um, my German team went to visit um, Bitterfeld Wolfen, where we talked to ex-solar workers and mayors and union leaders. I led the team to Ghana, where we talked to e-waste scrapyard workers and labor leaders as well. And I also led a team to the Congo the DRC, where we talked to 48 artisanal and industrial cobalt miners, drivers, traders, etc. This was complemented with an intense amount of field research. So Bruno visited seven vineyards, seven wine cellars, uh, and one wine trading fair, poor guy. To be fair, he also visited three nuclear power plants, so it kind of evened out. Um, my research team visited eight solar manufacturing sites. And then we have to happen to visit in Africa 20 scrapyards and 30 different mines or mining sites. Um, so quite uh, intensive data collection. And what we found, this will show you briefly um, our findings. Okay, why French wineries? Well, it turns out, this is from our evidence, a lot of wine growers are negatively impacted by nuclear power because it changes the microclimate. Nuclear power is thermoelectric generation that's changing the temperature of water and changing the temperature of air. That's why you often see huge volumes of steam whenever you go by nuclear power plants. And then you throw in these concerns about radioactive accidents and pollution, tritium and cesium in the water, um, and it negatively affects wine development. As one winemaker said, it was a mistake for us to think that we could live cohabitably with nuclear power. Or to put this in even more stark context, you know, the Triscotin nuclear facility has had three or four incidents in the past 15 years. Each of the time an incident happens, the local wineries lose 40% of their sales because no one wants to buy wine from like a nuclear accident zone. Um, and these are small and medium enterprises at the margin, they can't afford a 40% loss of sales any year. So a lot of them have gone bankrupt or have been forced into mergers and acquisitions. This shows you how close the vineyards get to the nuclear infrastructure. This is the Triscotin nuclear facility and the Triscotin winery 
which is literally about a kilometer away. Um, as the winemaker told us, imagine if this was on the bottle of wine, no one would ever drink it. So they've even tried to rename their winery so people don't associate it with Triscotin anymore to no avail. We never expected that our vulnerable group for German solar energy would be German solar workers. We didn't see that coming, but this is why, this is the quote from one of our experts. Well, you know what? The big vulnerable group to solar is not coal miners. It's not nuclear power workers. It's the solar workers themselves. The 100,000 people who lost their jobs over the past 10 years, you have trade unions behind saving coal. No one saved solar energy. They weren't unionized. They didn't have the protections. So you see this last part of the quote, workers in the German renewable energy sector are a vulnerable population. Or in the words of one of the mayors we spoke to in Bitterfeld Wolfen, which is where they put a lot of the manufacturing facilities, Berlin got the electricity, we got the ashes. They got everything associated with the downside of manufacturing, pollution, boom and bust cycles, lack of pensions. Um, and now, because they've all shut down, completely abandoned factory scapes um, that they have to maintain. So it's not just they've lost revenue and pension and taxes and all that. They then have to spend millions of euros maintaining infrastructure that's been abandoned that is prone to vagrancy and drug use and homelessness, et cetera. Um, and this is quite striking too, because this is the Sun Park, which is where Q-cells used to be. This used to be the world's biggest source of solar manufacturing. Now it's permanently shut and closed down. And actually Q-cells has been merged and bought out, I think by some Chinese company. So it's been a kind of huge backfire of German industrial strategy where they invested billions of euros only to see the market collapse 10 years later. And they pulled back uh, and have decided to support coal and coal workers, not solar workers. The third case is in Ghana, where we get to go to an electronic waste scrapyard. We correlated this one with smart meters because they have batteries and home displays and smart meters themselves only last about 10 years. And you can do the math, 56 million units needing replaced every 10 to 15 years. I actually have a smart meter. It actually lasted a year. It was replaced by, <laughs> Uh, within a year. So the lifetime can be even shorter if the meter goes bad. And again, what's the link? Well, you have hundreds of thousands of people also living at this scrapyard in Ghana, which is the biggest dump for scrap and e-waste in the world. It's where 70% of the e-waste from the UK goes, which was our case study. You have young children, as young as six, seven, or eight, engaged in the business. They drop out of school. This one tells us a story about a boy who died at the age of 12 uh, and how they're sick. And I saw this myself when I visited, you see children, they're sleeping um, on bricks, uh, just lying out in the open for a three or four hour break before they go back into the scrapyard. It is incredibly hazardous. You have open fires, open burning, you have black smoke. Uh, they burn a lot of the e-waste because it's an easier way to get to the gold, the copper and the other materials inside. This shows you a teenager uh, who's going through the waste after it's been burnt, try to look for things of value. And this would be another point if I was with you, I would say, what in the world is this thing in the middle of the photograph? And many of you would guess and say what you thought it was, um, but I'll cut to the chase, it's a cow. Um, and that cow is full of milk and they will drink the milk. And the river that you see behind them is their source of drinking water. Uh, you also have open air vegetable stalls, a mosque, a football pitch, and two schools in this scrapyard. And this is why rates of toxicity are actually higher for the community than they are for the workers at the scrapyard, because the community has to live there. Um, but the workers only come in shifts and often go back home. It's also why this is the part of Ghana that has the highest rate of birth defects, the lowest life expectancy, the highest rate of neonatal problems, um, and a whole host of other medical problems. I think life expectancy is less than 50 years of age, when the average for most of Ghana is about 70, 72, depending on gender and occupation. So our electronic waste flows are literally poisoning the communities. Um, and while we connected this to smart meters, 
it is also connected to heat pumps, solar photovoltaics, distributed storage, fuel cells. All of those generate very large volumes of e-waste. And here's a little statistic for you that I find extremely troubling. By the year 2050, solar energy will generate as much e-waste as all e-waste today. So we are literally creating a new e-waste problem in our rush, understandably, to adopt solar photovoltaics. All right, our final case is the Congo, uh, which is in the middle of Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, it's a very, very large country. So the DRC is actually about as large as Western Europe. Uh, it's one of the largest countries, fifth or fourth largest country in the world by space. It has a lot of its cobalt in the southeastern tip near Zambia, uh, near Lubumbashi, Lakashi, and Kowizi. That's where we visited. We visited all of the sites here that you can actually see um, in the red dots. And again, why? Well, the artisanal cobalt mining that we need for electric vehicle batteries, as well as for other electronics, uh, is very hazardous. And about 20% of the Congolese cobalt production is artisanal. So it's very low tech. And you can see one of the young miners here. This is from one of our experts. Mining is not living, it's dying. The moment you step into the mine, the clock starts ticking. You can die or get harmed in a variety of ways. Silicosis, mercury. You can even catch the plague, the bubonic plague in the middle of these mines uh, because they bring food in with them and the food brings rats and people get bit by rats. Keep in mind as well, that you want to stay in these mines for up to seven to 10 days, um, where do you go to the restroom? You just go in the corner. And so it literally smells like shit in the middle of the mine. As this one said, it's an underground circus full of animal excrement. Um, and that's just what can make you sick. You can still have accidents and you can still lose an arm or a leg or bleed to death in the middle of the jungle. You can see here how low tech this mining can become. You can also see this miner isn't even wearing shoes. Look at their flip-flops, which they've taken off. Notice that they're not even using a ladder. This miner doesn't have a shovel. He's mining with his hands. He has no mask, no PPE, no ventilation, and very inadequate structural support for the mine. It's just dug with a shovel, um, which explains why hundreds of these miners die every year in unreported accidents. You can also see connections to child labor. This shows you young children at the backside of an industrial mine who are looking through mine tailings, some of which are radioactive, some of which are very hazardous. Notice again, they're barefoot. Notice again, the complete lack of PPE. You can also see here a seven-year-old cobalt trader who is bringing his sack of cobalt to one of the trading depots um, near the trading road on uh, Lubumbashi. So the connections to child labor, uh, the United Nations estimates that there are about a million children engaged in mining in the Congo, not just for cobalt, that's for the entire sector. Um, but cobalt is one of the biggest sources of income at the moment, along with 3T. Uh, and so I would guess at least tens to 20 to 30,000 children miners are probably embedded into the cobalt supply chain. So on that incredibly depressing note, what does this mean for you back in beautiful California? What does this mean for us trying to study low carbon transitions? And it's not all bad. So if you remember, the first part of the talk was at least about benefits. And we have a whole host of benefits that are very hard to monetize. Guilt, guilt-free, pride. So I think that first of all, a call for us to do a better job. What methods and techniques can we utilize? to help monetize these very difficult things that we currently don't really grasp with well about the co-benefits to these transitions. Also, the ability for these transitions to be coupled, this is one of the technical benefits, also could create new complementarities or positive synergies that accelerate adoption. Those who adopt an EV then buy solar, those who buy solar buy it storage and then do prosuming, or they get a smart meter. So this also suggests that we need to become more better at maybe systems analysis rather than technologies analysis. And at least we have 128 co-benefits to offset the 120 injustices. If it's true that a lot of these co-benefits are not economic, 
then we probably need to consider non-economic instruments and how to motivate them, right? In very simple terms, if part of the reason people adopt solar is social and political, we also need social and political incentives to rival the economic ones, which just means a reminder, carbon taxes, cap and trade won't do it alone. We need more complex policy mixes that also tap into the social dimensions beyond the market. Now to the negative stuff, unfortunately, Low carbon transitions, which I still advocate for, I don't think any of this is a reason to abandon the four transitions. Uh, and in fact, I would guess if we were to map out the injustices with fossil fuels, they may be even more than what you've seen here. However, it doesn't mean that net carbon or net zero is net beneficial. We still see a troubling amount of toxic pollution, exploitation, patriarchy, discrimination, and injustice in our transitions. They're not just dominated by centralized nuclear power. We also see them in smart meters and EVs, right? And what's ironic is that policymakers here in Europe are actually using many of these devices to fight energy poverty here by getting homes energy storage and getting them electric mobility or putting solar panels on council homes. And so it's a really weird way of kind of one group of poor in one part of the world lose, so another group of poor in another part of the world benefit, poor on poor conflict. Moreover, it's not just about the technology. That whole element of procedural issues, governance, policy, regulation, makes it very hard to tease out within our evidence what was behind the technology, what was behind the program. In other words, is nuclear power bad? Or is the way that French nuclear power with secrecy, authoritarianism, and social exclusion was bad? Is it that solar energy is bad, or that the way that the Germans designed their feed-in tariff to benefit middle-income homes creates disparities in access? Is it that smart meters are bad, or is it the way that the UK government did a supplier-led rollout where the UK has 70 different suppliers, 10 of which just went bankrupt, each of them with their own proprietary smart meter? And if you switch suppliers, of which 4 million customers do a year, your smart meter stops working. So a lot of the issues were with the programs, not necessarily with the technology. Electric mobility may also not be bad in the form of e-bikes or micro scooters. Maybe it's just bad when it's conventional automobiles, right? Which perpetuate privatized motorized mobility rather than active walking and cycling. So again, very, very hard to tease out policy regimes behind the transitions here from the technologies. Those cosmopolitan injustices remind us about the map, the map of all the red countries, that each of these four transitions creates cascading injustices around the world. I didn't talk about all the nuclear ones, right? We have reactor designs being exported that may not be safe. We have uh, electricity trade undermining transitions in Poland and Switzerland because they can rely on nuclear power from France. I didn't even talk about uranium mining. French nuclear power relies on uranium mining from Niger and Azerbaijan and Canada and Australia, where it actually impinges on indigenous groups. And I also didn't talk about long lived nuclear waste and nuclear waste repositories, all of which create very pernicious multi scalar injustice issues. For solar, I talked a little bit about things like low wage manufacturing and Uyghur manipulation in China. Um, I didn't talk so much about factory waste streams, which is another issue that you have toxic pollution around factories that make solar in places like China and even in Germany. For smart meters, they're partly implicated in the cobalt mining one, because you need copper and cobalt for smart meter batteries, uh, and troubling flows of electronic waste in Ghana. And then here, you can see for EVs, it's things like extractive industries, but also things like uh, where cheap and dirty petrol cars go when people in Norway adopt an EV. They don't just disappear. They end up going to Poland or Estonia or even parts of Africa. And I'm quite concerned. So I'm a big advocate still even after doing this research of Sustainable Development Goal 7, which is clean energy for all, which is about doubling renewable energy and promoting energy access. And I think clean energy in that way is a human right. But I think how we currently secure that human right creates too many trade-offs with other human rights 
gender equality, labor protection, life on land, life below water, which leads to, like I said, poor on poor conflict or green on green conflict, which is very, very problematic. And I think analytically, one of the biggest benefits to these whole systems approaches is it allows us to recognize this very troubling decarbonization divide where currently we are decarbonizing. But we're doing so in a way where the global north is getting cleaner and the global south is getting more carbon intensive. So it's not eliminating injustice, it's just recirculating it. And I think that's very much how we need to embrace more of the new frontiers that couple whole systems thinking with looking at winners and losers. Uh, and with that, I'm very happy to open it up uh, for questions. So thank you, Alyssa. Thank you. Yeah, see the applause is coming up. So guys, uh, raise your hands um, or you can enter questions in the, in the chat. And if you guys don't do it, I have like a whole list of questions, but <laughs> so I see, I see Meg first and then Jess. Meg, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much for this presentation. I also have um, a million questions, but I will save them. Um, the one I wanted to ask right now is I was curious if in any of the interviews or focus groups, if anyone brought up colonialism um, during the discussion of these impacts, particularly, I know the impacts on indigenous communities came up a lot in literature, but then also um, relating to the situation of mining in the Democratic Republic of Congo. I think that's a pretty direct result of colonial mining operations. So I was just curious if that, if you see a way to incorporate that in your research or if anyone brought it up. Very, very good question. Um, yes, so it did come up a few times, not a lot. I think a handful of people even used the word colonialism in the interviews, talking about these colonial relationships with Africa, especially. Uh, and how European states are outsourcing, you know, pernicious effects there. Um, it also came up in a different way in that some people thought that low carbon transitions themselves were a new form of imperialism, a way for Europe to kind of capture markets and dominate markets. And I get that in a way it kind of is because the European Union is looking at the next energy transition. And they've made all these investments in wind and solar ahead of the US because they're thinking come 2050, we wanted to win the race, right? Um, and so I kind of get that it, in a well, it's kind of like you could reread the transitions as an attempt to make the global energy system like Europe with European technology, European patents. Um, uh, from rough guess, I think that colonialism probably came up four or five times out of the total data set. So we're not talking like a huge amount, but it did come up some. The other thing that's quite interesting, Margaret, is we mentioned this in, in I think, the decarbonization and discontents paper. Not everyone could identify injustices. That was also quite interesting. Like in about 10 or 15 of the interviews, when we asked that question, can you think of any injustices with EVs? They'd be like, no. <laughs> Which also shows you the invisibility of the injustices for even a quarter of our experts who, who thought really they were honest. No, I don't see anything. What could be wrong with a smart meter? Injustice? It's just a smart meter. Um, so it also shows you disagreement, and it's why the frequency counts aren't higher because the, you know even though we had 64 interviews, you know the highest frequency count is like 15 or 16 for a lot of those injustices. So that also shows you how invisible they are, even to our experts. Right, Jess, go ahead. Yeah, thank you uh, for such an interesting and great talk. Um, my question is really about what your approach is to getting into contact with the uh, cobalt miners and mining communities within the DRC um, and kind of what stakeholders you talked to there. So great, great question. I, I, I've given a podcast about an hour about that because um, it's, it's a very fascinating case. I'll give you the short answer. Um, so we didn't know initially we were gonna do that study. So the second phase of the Unipath's work was grounded in the first phase. So we only knew about some vulnerable groups because it emerged from the data from the first wave of interviews. So in a way we didn't know where we would go. And actually we were thinking of not doing that case. We actually were thinking of doing a uranium mining case instead, because we wanted kind of two global ones in Africa and then two ones in Europe. So we had a lot of discussions and debates and, and at the last minute only chose the Congo. When we decided to do the Congo, 
we benefit basically because we have the Institute for Development Studies here at Sussex. And so Sussex is kind of known for having where I'm at, which is called SPRU, Science Policy Research Unit. And then we have the Institute for Development Studies, IDS. IDS is amazing. They're number one in the world for development studies. So they already had contacts in the Congo. They'd already done work on extractive industries in the Congo. I actually spoke to someone who did his PhD in the Congo working for IDS. So that, that really, really helped because they put me in touch with people at the University of Lubumbashi, as well as people in the capital city. Um, and it's from there that you spiraled out. So the short answer is we had good networks that were already established there. Once that happened, it was another six months. It's one of the most difficult places to do research in, not just because of political violence and uncertainty, like it's on the watch list for a lot of traveling communities. And I had to do a security training and briefing to go and call my head of department twice a day to make sure I was safe. And I had a security escort with me at all times, um, but also in terms of approvals. We had to spend thousands of pounds and also get approvals from Congolese Secret Service, both of the provincial governors of the states that we were in, um, as well as the president, well, the prime minister's um, kind of office. All of them had a fee for us to do research. So there was also that you had, we had to take the time to invest and build networks. And then the final bit of this is we made sure it wasn't just us. And so I went to the Congo, but we had a Congolese team of local researchers who spoke French and local dialects. And there were six of them. We hired them for a month and paid them fairly generously by Congolese standards. Um, and so that was also ensuring both that we gave something back, but it also meant that we could divide the research team up and the miners really opened up more to the Congolese researchers than they did to some of the foreigners. And so I guess using local researchers was also a huge plus. This all underlies having funding. <laughs> this is a half a million dollar project. And so, which is also quite troubling because it's like, who else can do this research? Who can pick up and fly on a plane to the Congo and afford to give all these you know, certificates and approvals from the Congolese Secret Service? Um, so we have the luxury of being well-funded and we certainly needed it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read uh, Fatima's question. It's, it got seconded by Sarah as well. Um, in your first study, how did you end up coding injustices, especially given the researcher that researchers might have different opinions on what that is compared to the respondents? Really easy. Uh, and so I think their respondent views be different is what matters rather than the researcher views. Um, we use the word injustice in our question. So when we said tell us about the injustices of this transition. We didn't say, tell us about the costs, tell us about the impacts, tell us about the losers. We use that word injustice. And whatever that person said, it was then coded in justice terms, even if it was an impact, even if it was anticipated rather than really occurring, even if it was things like environmental destruction, if they answered that particular question that way, that's how we, so it's self-defined in the words of the respondents. For validity, every interview is double coded. So even if one of my researchers may have thought traffic congestion, I'm not really sure I'm gonna mark that, then a second researcher read it. And actually we did an intercoded reliability test that was 100%, I mean, it's qualitative data. So it was kind of a, it's not that hard, right? You have this question, what tell me the injustices and the respondent gives you three. It takes about a minute to look at in the transcript. And so, I mean, two people looking at the transcript are most likely gonna come up with the same thing. And they did, but we at least had that double coding for that process uh, to make sure that we had a bit more rigor. And most of the interviews were done in teams anyway, especially for the first phase. Um, so yeah, self-defined injustices by the respondents. We're gonna, I'm gonna try for one more question because we're sort of up against our, our end time here. Um, so Paco, please go ahead. And thank you so much, Benjamin, for that uh, fantastic presentation and research and uh, especially for like such a comprehensive view of energy systems. Um, so at the risk of this being a very naive question, um, at the beginning you were talking about like how uh, you did some analysis of different energy systems and, and um, through like the uh, principles of, of justice. And it seemed like none of the ones that you were looking at uh, kind of checked all the boxes. So the question would be like, overall, wouldn't creating energy systems with an energy justice focus 
uh, have a substantially better outcome for humanity than our current profit-driven energy systems, even if they don't check all the principles of justice boxes. So um, it seems kind of like trying to transition, uh, we could easily fall into paralysis by analysis. No, it's not a naive question at all. It's a very good one. And you're absolutely right. I mean, our intent with this wasn't to thwart those transitions. It was recognize that they don't benefit everyone. And then let's, let's implement some policies to change it. One of the questions we also asked in our interviews was what policies need changed to make the transitions more just. And that's a whole section of the paper. And we mapped out like 30 things that you could do. Um, some of them very low cost, like get these miners PPE and do better royalty as a concession sharing agreements between the joint ventures of foreign mining companies and local actors. And there's a whole history of Congolese cobalt mining um, where basically they've privatized what was public mining spaces uh, that have really left the Congolese people in, in, in a lurch. So there are very practical, actionable things that our research can point to. Um, so I don't think it's we necessarily have to have paralysis from this analysis, especially when we're able to move forward. But the deeper question, and I kind of, we touch on this at the conclusion of one of the articles, some of our injustices are not really the fault of the transitions that we examined. Like they were there already. Like the way the Congolese politically evolved after Belgian control and the current way that everyone exploits the Congo for minerals. We even used uranium from the Congo in the Manhattan Project, by the way. So it's kind of like, can you really blame uh, EVs when we already had cobalt supply chains there that were already kind of you know marginalizing Congolese workers? And same with scrapyards. So that scrapyard in Ghana existed well before we started to think about smart meters. It's been there for 40 years. Uh, and so in those situations, these transitions don't create new injustices. They just reify what's already there, structural problems with capitalism and geopolitics. However, in two of the other cases, the transitions did introduce entirely new vulnerabilities that didn't exist before. French wineries would be doing darn fine if the French nuclear power rollout never came along. And those workers who lost their jobs and were victimized by German solar energy Right, wouldn't have had to go through the horrors of unemployment and re relocation and community disarticulation if that hadn't happened the way it did. So those are situations where those two transitions did harm communities. Uh, and I think that's the trick, right? Recognizing sometimes that it's not a new injustice, it's just exacerbating an existing one. And in other cases it is. And I think you split those out and you have two very different types. Well, I realize we have one more question in the chat and maybe I'll shorten it. This question is from, from Hong, um, who, who was basically asking about who recognizes exporting dirty cars as an injustice and maybe more broadly, like, you know, when the perspectives of someone in the receiving country who might appreciate having mobility options that wouldn't otherwise be there. Absolutely. So you're absolutely right. This would have been Norwegian respondents who talked about their concerns that were all these you know, old Skodas and Peugeots going after people buy their nice shiny new Tesla. Um, it's very possible that if we had gone to places like Poland and said, oh, you just received a really nice car you probably couldn't have afforded and it's almost new, it's five years old, they would not view that as an injustice. This is the relationality of injustices. Um, both across the global north, global south divide, but also across our respondents. What one respondent viewed as an injustice, another respondent may have viewed as a co-benefit even, um, which is quite interesting. And that's, I think, where the recognition principle of justice serves well. Uh, and that I'm not saying either of those respondents are right or wrong. To each of them, it was an injustice or a benefit. And who am I to correct them and think otherwise? And so I think that's another thing you can take from our study is that that's what's so troubling about justice. It is relational. And one person's injustice is another person's justice.